Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Lecture 12 of English 1120, Time and History in Literature. Tonight, we're going to do our introduction to Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, Part 2. So looking forward to that. It should be a fairly brief overview of the novel, picking up where we, we left off last week. So to remind you of, of what we discussed a little bit last week, I'll say that we we mentioned that the novel was situated most profitably within the modernist aesthetic movement of the early, early 20th century. And we talked a bit about the roots of modernism and how it could be seen as rooted in a number of intellectual and social political um, crises, so to speak. So on the intellectual side, we talked about the, the type of crises that were started because of the thinking of Darwin, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. So each in their own way presented a view of human existence that let's say cheapened it compared to the way in which we valorized human reason, human achievement, human values and ideals before that. Similarly, in terms of historical developments and the social political crises of the time, <clears throat> the modernists were living in the wake of World War I and the incredible loss of life and barbarity that happened in that conflict. And in the wake of that war, we're, we're left wondering, is this the, the progress of civilization that we heard so much about during the 19th century? Is this the sum substance of European civilization leading to tens of millions of, of deaths on, in, the, in the fields of Europe? Also in the wake of the, uh, the Spanish flu, the influenza that uh, struck from uh, 1918 to 1920 in a number of waves, both of those events, World War I and, and that influenza pandemic, find their way in the novel uh, in, in their own way, those, the echoes of those, those events leave scars on the, the active memory of the key characters. So two of the characters we'll talk about, Septimus Smith is, is in a way reliving scars, psychological scars, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, or as they called it, shell shock that he uh, experienced in the war. And there are uh, a couple of references to the fact that Mrs. Dalloway, Clarissa, is no longer the same since her illness, having contracted the in influenza. So, so those are the, let's say, the types of crises that modernist aesthetics in general were responding to and and had to, let's say, think of a new way of representing the world and human existence within the world, given, given this more, say, relativistic outlook without a sense of humanity progressing towards a rational goal. Uh, and we, in, in some of the responses that we had mentioned, we talked about <clears throat> in the visual arts, Cubism, so uh, so Cubism, Imagism in poetry. We talked about James Joyce's Ulysses. We talked a bit about T. S. Eliot's The Wasteland. So all of them, in their each in their own way, is it, are are trying to take ways of representing the world, how art normally represents the world, and 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 think of how to represent the world in a way that highlights, let's say perspectives and fragments, that it isn't a coherent and rational whole. Also, um, the modernists were trying to look more closely at time in a new way. We talked about the other revolution being revolutions in, in physics, so general and special relativity, a new way of thinking about time, as well as uh, uh, philosophers, Bergson and the phenomenologists also trying to think about internal time consciousness. How does, how do we experience time as the flow of time? So the modernists are, are 
are trying to represent that as well in their in their literature through stream of consciousness and we we talked about that quickly with james joyce but also the cubists in the visual arts are in a way showing us an image uh, both fragmented from different perspectives but those fragments are maybe the object viewed from different points of time as well so they're trying to again experiment with the representation of time so mrs dalloway i think can be profitably understood as firmly within that tradition and and i would say uh, probably a shining example or maybe in, in terms of the literary field uh, my favorite example of that modernist aesthetic so we talked a bit about narration in Mrs. Dalloway and how, how Virginia Woolf is, is trying to undertake her own experiments with narration in order to represent, um, well, the fragment, fragmented nature of existence, but also whether or not, and we'll talk more about this tonight, there are deep connections underneath what seem to be fragmented human existence and the existence of the world and also how the narration is changing the representation of time and we'll definitely come back to that again tonight so i want to share a, a powerpoint slide here that'll help guide the discussion So here we have our here we are. <clears throat> so I'll we talked quickly about this, but one of the one of the narrative techniques that Wolf uses is free indirect discourse. So uh, I refer you to this chart. I won't go through it fully again, but as a way of distinguishing free indirect discourse from direct discourse, which is you know in, exactly in, representing quoted words as they were said by a character. A, narr a narrative voice can also use indirect discourse where they don't present the quote quoted words. So Mary said sadly that she had to go. And then on the third column is where we get free and direct discourse, where it's more difficult to tell where the narrator stops, the narrative voice stops, and the character's thoughts or discourse start. So the example I have here is Mary was sad, I have to go. So ostensibly the second sentence there is, is said by Mary or thought by Mary, but it's there's no tag there, there's no indication, there's no uh, quotation marks in one way of looking at the sentence that this the sentence could be the narrator in some way saying that uh, so so again that that identity of the narrator and the character are, are is blurred we looked at the first few first couple paragraphs of of the novel and in pages three and four last week and underscored how the narration goes from looking through Clarissa Dalloway's perspective and then moves seamlessly to that of another character. So again, underscoring this notion of what I'll call deep connections among things, among perspectives, among people, and um, also connections among time so moments in time so we're we're experiencing a moment in 1923 the whole novel takes place in one day a hot day in july 1923 but the characters are drawn back to previous moments at uh, as as when they were youth in in a summer home also to 1918 to the war to to their illness um so, so those types of temporal connections are also at play. I want to remind everyone we we saw this at a, a previous lecture. This this diagram, uh, but this 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 representation of the the amount of story time that is represented in the average page, two hundred and fifty words or so, 
of narrative discourse, so the actual pages of a novel. So the study done by Ted Underwood and uh, uh, a leading digital humanist, so someone who who is taking a, a, a very progressive approach to the study of literary texts through, through taking their digitized form and performing different uh, digitally enabled analyses, but other quantitative analyses in general. So this one, you don't need to be digitally, digitally uh, um, aided in order to take this, undertake this analysis, him and his team took a number of novels, sampled several as, uh, parts of the novel for, for a page of narrative discourse, estimated about how much time of story was taking place in that page. So if they read the page and in terms of the story, the first one, Robinson Crusoe, so maybe it was Robinson Crusoe describing what he did at the beginning of the week. And by the time they got to the end of the page, Robinson Crusoe was describing what he had done at the end of the week, you know, so, so a lot of the middle part of that novel is his journal, so he, he, it's kind of a first person narration there. <clears throat> so what we see in that trajectory of what the, the amount of story time that's represented is a, a long gradual decline to the moment where we see the, the, the modernists at the beginning of the 20th century here and Mrs. Dalloway is one example of many, where around a page is representing only about six minutes. So we have, uh, and this is a logarithmic scale, so a hundredfold compression from the beginning of the 18th century to the 20th century here in terms of the amount of time. So a hundredfold reduction in the amount of time represented. So what's happening is, gradually, well, and well, not gradually, but very rapidly over that time, but steadily, uh, the, the narration is focusing more and more on inner thoughts of characters. And the, the let's expanding more and more on associations of those thoughts. Now it had thought, it had originally been theorized before this type of study, this, this type of quantitative study about it, that it, it was more like, more like dropping off a cliff. People realized that with 20th century novels, especially Ulysses and Proust and, and Virginia Woolf, because the whole novel was taking place in one day, people realized that something was different was happening and they really focused in on on the, er, these modernists of the early 20th centuries as really revolutionizing narrative. But really this study has shown that is, it has been a gradual uh, and a steady decline in the story time that has been represented. So, so that's a, of interest in itself. The other interesting point, as I said here, is, is think about <clears throat> what that means for the representation of time in this novel. So in this novel, Everything that happens is reflecting back to things in the past. It's, it's, it's projecting somewhat to the party that's going to happen at the, the end of the day, but not too much. There's, not a, there's a little bit of anticipation. The beginning of the novel, Clarissa says, I'll go buy the flowers herself. And that's part of that is I, I need to get flowers. I need to decorate the home. I need to take the hinges off the doors in order for the party. So a lot of that is futural uh, projecting of, of possibilities of what needs to be done for, for that future party. But a lot of it is the, is the space that's taken up in the novel is really interactions of characters and their reflections about what that character was like when they knew them so many years ago or in the past or, or moments that they, that they felt awkward or confused or happy or sad in the past. So, so there are, again, in the Proust's famous title, title, Remembrance of Things Past is really kind of dominates the narrative there uh, and, and shadows the present. <clears throat> so let's talk about this, this theme, as I mentioned, of deep connections in, in Mrs. Dalloway. So, the novel's narrative describes and tries to represent this flow of time, as I've mentioned, 
<clears throat> and the, the entire narrative as it, as it takes place in one day. <clears throat> so as a result, there's this presence of the past that I've described. There's the so social and psychological impact of World War I and the summer in Burton, that's the summer, the summer there, uh, the summer home there in, in the 1890s that was intensely felt by Clarissa and Peter. He had proposed marriage, she had refused. There is some contemplation of the future, as I said, in, in relation to death is where the future comes most, let's say poignantly, especially at the end, especially with reflection on Septimus's death. <clears throat> the other way, the other way that time, let's say, really towers to, to uh, literally in the novel is through the presence of Big Ben and this kind of objective time that rings literally throughout the novel when uh, the bells go off on every hour throughout the novel. So um, uh, I think some people would say that this it, in a way represents kind of the oppressions of, uh, of societal norms, that this is a kind of a, an oppressive state or, or societal norm of, of timekeeping that's, that's resonating throughout the novel. So I think there's some of that. I think more, um, more pertinently, I would say it's, it's this interplay of what we'll see is objective time and phenomenological time. So phenomenology, remember just the experience, what does it feel like? So there's objective time, the, the time of Big Ben, it's def, it's objectively one o'clock. And that's a that's an object that's out there. It's a definite point of time that we can measure and we can come to agreement upon. But then there's the experience of what that time means as it flows and as as we experience what it means, so to speak, to reach one o'clock as part of going about one's day while getting this, while being on a bus, while going towards um, um, home in order to prepare for the party. So the objective time resonates throughout. So the, the chime of, of Big Ben is described as resonating in these rings that go throughout the city and it impacts a character in different ways, depending on how they're experiencing and dealing, experiencing and dealing with the world, and that that becomes that interaction of the objective and the phenomenological. <clears throat> so I, I kind of address that point. Another example of how this occurs it would be uh, we see cars backfiring. Um, early in the novel, so um, so page page ten on the PDF I, I have linked in the course course website. There's there's cars backfiring, and some characters are looking and, and say, "Is that a gunshot?" And, and then another character sa character says, "Oh, those cars," you know. So different people experiencing that um, that common object uh, differently. And then sky writing, there was a sky writing example, each character discerns different letters and, and there's but basically two pages of description there of the different characters making out different letters. So very similar to what's happening with what ha with when Big Ben rings throughout the novel, different characters are taking that differently based on their experience of the temporal flow of the day. <clears throat> I want to point out now uh, what I would call Clarissa's transcendental theory. So related to this notion of the deep connections that are underneath things that we might not be aware of. Clarissa, so this is a quote from page 109 in the PDF. Clarissa once going on top of an omnibus with him somewhere, it, it ended in a transcendental theory that since our apparitions are so momentary compared with the other, the unseen part of us, which spreads wise, the unseen might survive. So there's this notion that, that we might survive death, et cetera, given that there are these unseen elements of us that, um, that, that are kind of spread out as part of our experience uh, and, and could endure maybe more than our body can. And I'll just compare it with, uh, I'll go to the PDF here and, and so we can see it. I'll com 
could compare what I just quoted with, this is from page six on the PDF. She would not say of anyone in the world now that they were this or that, or were that. She felt very young, at the same time un unspeakably aged. She sliced like a knife through everything, at the same time was outside looking on. She had a perpetual sense as she watched the taxi cabs of being out, out far out to sea and alone. She always had the feeling that it was very, very dangerous to live even one day. Not that she thought herself clever or much out of the ordinary. How she had got through life on the few twigs of knowledge Fraulein Daniels gave them, she could not think. She knew nothing, no language, no history. She scarcely read a book now, except memoirs in bed. And yet to her, it was absolutely absorbing. All this, the cabs passing, and she would not say of Peter, she would not say of herself, I am this, I am that. So there's this, in, the, in this passage we're reading, this refusal to define things as objects. So they can't be this or that, because Clarissa is experiencing the, the kind of stream-like flow of things uh, that they can become this and that, that they're flowing through time and that they have deep connections to one another through time and through their experiences. So I'll go back to the, to the presentation here. So uh, I'll just, going back to Septimus's, this character, so he's a, a war hero. Uh, he had won crosses, it says, um, and he entered the war at the beginning and survived miraculous, miraculously in the end. He suffers from shell shock, as I mentioned, and he's treated by these unsympathetic doctors, Holmes and Bradshaw, and he's paralyzed by the sounds from the cityscape. So the car's backfiring. I, I mentioned that, that, that event early on in the novel. And he'll, he reflects on his lost friend from the war, uh, Evans, and, and experiences that he's still having conversations with Evans. Um, and he, he talks early on of killing himself, eventually does do so. Um, and we have indication that Wolf intended Septimus to be Clarissa's double. So in a way he is, you know, they they never encounter one another. They don't know one another, but in a way his death touches Clarissa at the end. Someone at the party mentions it and she has a, at first a shallow and a somewhat deeper reflection on it later. Um, and they, they both have these scarring events that I talked about that bring them to the past. And in a way, they're two sides of the same coin, you know. So Septimus is obviously defined by the medical establishment as insane, as, as, as scarred by this, as living these virtual moments in the past that are not real. Whereas Clarissa is, is sane, a member, uh, respectable member of uh, upper class society. So, so that line is somewhat arbitrary, that arbitrarily drawn in, in the novel or we, we see that society can draw that line arbitrarily. Uh, Septimus oscillates between these visions of despair, and I've cited some pages you can look to there, we won't go to him, um, where he, see, he sees the concealed truth of the great authors of the tradition that they hated humanity. It's another way that they're doubles, uh, Septimus and Clarissa. Clarissa has an affinity for and, and is drawn by books as she walks down the street that, that are in the shop windows of Shakespeare and, and, and there's references to Shakespeare plays by her in her thoughts. So too Septimus. I say here antinatalism. So antinatalism is this belief that existence is so bad. Existence is so horrible that it's unethical to have children. So you should not have children. So anti-birth, it's an anti-giving, uh, birthing uh, new, new offspring. Uh, so there's this thought in Septimus that we shouldn't be bringing new life into this world with its non-ending uh, meaninglessness. Then it oscillates between that and visions of affirmation that we see in the, the pages I've, I've mentioned as, and he shares this 
kind of vision of the deep connections that are underneath things. And you could compare this to the kind of transcendental theory that I talked about with Clarissa. So the, the Shakespeare references, just uh, I want to underscore those. They, they, they are significant in the novel. Uh, we won't go through them thoroughly, and I won't expect you to have read the Shakespeare plays, but just uh, I think it, it again points to the deep connections in that there is within the language and within the tradition, just by referring to these, something that Wolf is tapping into. And, and Wolf, like Clarissa and like Septimus, is able to say, okay, well, it looks like we're all alienated in this city life as we go through a day and we see people that don't know us. And, and, but underneath, we, have, we are sharing these experiences. And underneath, we are sharing uh, a temporal continuity with the past. And part of that shared past are, are scarring events like the war. And part of the shared past is great books of the tradition that, that still shape the tradition, such as Shakespeare. And so, so those are referred to. And, and one that comes up a, a few times is a quote from Cymbeline, uh, where um, this, this line, fear no more the heat of the sun, is, is from, um, is from Cymbeline uh, Act 4, Scene 2. Uh, the, the play itself is, is kind of an extended drama of mis mistaken identity, of not knowing the other. And uh, this line comes up as, as these characters think that the main character, uh, uh, Imogen, disguised as Fidele, I, uh, they think she's dead, and they uh, they sing this song over her um, over her presumed corpse. You know, fear no more, no more the heat of the sun. You don't have to worry about that the sun anymore. You know, the heat of the sun because you've passed on to somewhere likely better. Um, so this play, we have a resolution through a certain kind of Deus ec, ec machina, which is you know a god from the machine and. Uh, so God, God's literally intervene at the end to, to save the day. Um, uh, and this is a, a device from ancient Greek tragedy. Um, but that uh, is obviously not available to the modern, modern novelist. So there's no deus ac, ec machina to save Septimus or Clarissa in her morbid thinking. The other references to Shakespeare, Othello, you know, a play of, of jealousy, of not knowing the mind of the other. Again, this, the fragmentation on one level of not knowing the other. Clarissa not knowing what are the thoughts of, of her husband and, and being jealous of the lunch that he had with, uh, with uh, Miss Bruton. And Antony and Cleopatra also referenced there, lovers who pursue their passion in the face of the forces of history, I think is also half operative in the novel. Um, <clears throat> so early on, and she sees no reason to fear death, uh, as she in a way lives on in interactions with others, and I'll just refer you to page seven in the PDF there, and uh, when we see her reaction to Septimus's suicide, 131 to 32, I won't turn to that, I think it's, but, but do look at that in terms of trying to get a sense of Clarissa's focus on death as the novel progresses, especially, you know, as this kind of awareness of finitude as, as drawing a circle around the day for, for Clarissa. And uh, with that, we'll end our discussion of Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. As I said, uh, one of my favorite, probably my favorite 20th century novel, um, uh, and by written by an incredible uh, author. So I recommend highly that you, if you haven't had a chance to read it, to read it as well as any of her other novels, which are also great. Now we're going to have one lecture I, I'm going to record and I will post uh, one final lecture that discusses very quickly the final exam. You can also, of course, email me if you have questions about the final exam, but I will go through the final exam and the expectations. So please do look at that lecture before you email me. Thank you very much, everyone.